Welcome to Ignite to Impact, a weekly podcast that explores what it takes to make your community, our nation, and the world a better place. You've tuned in to be inspired and enlightened as we pull back the curtain and dive into intimate and energetic conversations with achievers and doers. We are talking with leaders who are in the trenches making phenomenal changes through business, nonprofits, education, and the arts. Our goal? To encourage, motivate, and challenge you to go to the next level in leadership. Now, here's your host, Master Leadership Strategist, Dr. Geneva Williams. So, let's ignite to impact. Well, hi there. This is Dr. Geneva, and welcome once again to Ignite to Impact. Greetings from Detroit, and you know I'm in the fabulous studios of Gerald McBride, voiceover production studio, and you know the world will get no better if we just let it be. Wake up, everybody. Stay woke. Welcome again to Ignite to Impact, those conversations that we have with leaders about making the world a better place. And every week, you know, we bring you some inspiring stories, people from all walks of life, artists, entrepreneurs, business folk, nonprofit executives, everyday folk who are just unleashing their leadership, solving problems in their community, creating change, leaving impact, whether they're fighting hunger or finding ways to end homelessness, helping children learn how to read, working to eliminate poverty. They're dealing with issues such as education, race relations, transportation, crime. Well, we're traveling all around the country and we'll be right here in the D learning about what real leaders do day to day, how they ignite collaboration and turn bad situations around and still stay excited about their own journey in leadership. And we're going to discover how leaders leave legacy. Well, you know, I've, I, I have one of my favorite African proverbs. Leadership is best taught by leaders. Well, today I have a leader excellence, and I'm talking about a leader who just not who, who, who hasn't just unleashed his leadership in one area or, or maybe in two areas, but in three areas and is now going to a fourth. I'm talking about sports hero, businessman, mayor, Dave Bing. Three distinct areas that he's accomplished success in, that he's led. He was elected as the mayor of the city of Detroit in May 2009. As a graduate of, uh, a native of Washington, D.C., he's a graduate of Syracuse University, and he was bestowed an honorary doctor of law degree in 2006. He was a standout basketball player in high school and college, but then in professional sports. And he came to Detroit in 1966, because he was drafted by the Pistons as their number one pick. And when he retired his jersey, number 21, it was the first time in Detroit that the Pistons had retired a jersey, number 21. He was, hey, all voted as one of the top 50 basketball players of all time, inducted into Michigan Hall of Fame just on the court. But he didn't stop there. He turned his strategies that he learned from the court to business and was the founder of an automotive supply corporation where he served as president and chairman and recognized the Bing Group. His company was recognized as one of the nation's top minority owned companies. But again, he did not stop. He unleashed his leadership in the city, deciding to run for mayor to help rebuild Detroit 
a city that he had been part of for over 40 years. And he proved that the basics of good performance, integrity, and business can be applied anywhere. And he showed that. And we as Detroiters and many across the nation are so grateful to him for his leadership and how he established a renewed sense of trust and hope to the city of Detroit. So, you know, I could go on and on. You can hear me talking about this man and you see, I know you hear in my voice uh, how much I admire him. And let me just tell you, that's just not coming from my voice. And for me, there are hundreds and thousands of people who feel the same way that I do. And so I want to bring you um, Mayor Dave Bing. And then I'm going to give you a little, little surprise. We ain't going to talk too much about all of that. His success in business on the basketball court and as mayor, we're really going to talk about what his crowning achievement is today, and that's working with young people. So, Mayor Bing, welcome. Thank you so much, and it's my pleasure being with you, and it's awfully good seeing you again. You know, uh, I just, you know, I'm real honored, so I'm just grinning all over, so let me be grinning all over. But I got to tell you that one of the things that I do, uh, that I love to do with my guests, that I love to find out from leaders, and I want our listening audience to know, is about, you know, a little bit more about leaders, and particularly uh how they grew up. So can you give us a picture of what the young Dave Bing was like? Um, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I had two really loving parents. Uh, my parents are from the South, South, South Carolina. They moved to Washington um, right after their teenage years uh, and got married and started a family. Um, neither one of my parents finished high school. Um, but they knew how important education was. And my other three siblings, I have an older sister and a younger brother and then a younger sister. Um, I'm the only one that went to college. And uh, you know, and one of the reasons I went to college was because uh, I had an athletic scholarship. My ah. parents weren't wealthy, they weren't rich, they didn't have the money to send any of us to college. And I was an outstanding athlete in high school, and I had over a hundred scholarships uh, mm, when I when I came 100 out. Hundred scholarships. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. And um, I decided to go to Syracuse University. Okay. Uh, I grew up in a black uh, neighborhood uh, from kindergarten through the twelfth grade. Everybody in my neighborhood, everybody in my school looked like me. Mm -hmm. I never went to school with a white person, and I never had um, a teacher or an administrator um, that didn't look like me. Mm -hmm. And so when I chose to go to Syracuse, everybody said, you're nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, and number mm -hmm. one, they've lost 27 games in a row. <laughs> okay. and, and you're this outstanding <laughs> All-American high school uh -huh. player. Why would you go to a school uh, that's lost so many games? I said, because I know I'm going to play. Uh -huh. So okay. um, I chose Syracuse <laughs> not because um, I, I, I was just in, in, uh, interested in sports. I was recruited by the first black to ever win the Heisman Trophy, Ernie Davis. Mm -hmm. Ernie was a senior. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, I visited Syracuse, and he was my chaperone. He took me around, oh, okay. and he was the epitome of a college athlete. Mm -hmm. Not only was he a great football player, but he was a very good student. And he really talked to me mm -hmm. and convinced me that mm -hmm. you ought to come here because you can really make a difference in turning this program around. And I chose to go to Syracuse, and I'm glad I made that mm -hmm. decision. But, uh, you know, my background coming up was like so many other young kids in the inner city from urban America. Um, grew up poor. Um, didn't know I was poor. Okay. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, grew up in the church. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a strong community that was very supportive. A lot of good f uh, fellows in the neighborhood uh, were protecting guys like me who were coming up, and they saw us with potential. And, and as I look back, and I get to Washington still, get back as often as I can, two or three times a year, because there are so many lifelong friends that I have that are still there. And I'm fortunate that most of them are still alive. Mm -hmm. And so we get together and just talk about our upbringing and what it was like and what we're doing now. And, and, uh, and it's, it's great. And so, Mr. Mayor, so you, I love that you get together 
still now and talk about your upbringing. Well, tell us one of the great stories y'all talk about. I know there's probably a lot of them uh, that you could, but could you share something with us? Um, <laughs> as a young athlete growing up um, in Washington, um, you know, we're surrounded by Maryland and Virginia. Mm-hmm. Uh, both back in the early uh 50s and 60s, segregation was still Mm -hmm. (laughs) pretty rampant. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't go um, to either the Maryland side or the Virginia side to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one day uh, we snuck over on the Maryland side and we got run away by a lot of white boys. They jumped on one of our guys, beat him Mm -hmm. up pretty good. And, you know, uh, a few days later, we saw uh, these guys walking down the street uh, mm-hmm. on the district side. Mm-hmm. Needless to say, we had to uh, <laughs> we pay had back? to, we pay, had to back? pay them back. We had to pay them back. <laughs> and you know, the police came, okay. and uh, nobody got in trouble. Uh-huh. And uh, it wasn't a real ugly thing because back then, a fight was with your fists. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, unlike yes. today, you mm-hmm. know, people are killing each other. Mm-hmm. That wasn't in our minds back then, but mm-hmm. payback was something that we had to do to protect mm-hmm. uh, our guy who mm-hmm. got jumped on mm-hmm. by a group of guys. Yeah, and I know that area too, my my, my uh, dad went to Morgan State down in Baltimore, mm-hmm. and he would tell me stories also about, and he was, he was a basketball player as well, <laughs> um, and went to Morgan on a scholarship, yeah. basketball scholarship, but he would tell me also about places as a young athlete that he could go and places that he couldn't go. And he used to tell me about the kinds of leadership lessons he would learn from that. And I couldn't understand it, but he would explain to me that, yeah, it's those kinds of struggles that kind of teach you. What were some of the, did did you learn some stuff? Did you learn some leadership lessons from you know, being in the streets and in, in down in Maryland and Virginia and not being able to go one yeah. way or the other? Well, there were so many stories. I mean, it started with my parents because when we would go back in the summer and, and visit, my dad was from Aiken, South Carolina. My mom is from um, from the capital of, uh, of South Carolina. And uh, we go down and visit. Uh-huh. And um, back then, You know, you had to take your food on the trip because, you know, there were bathrooms and gas stations Mm -hmm. and things like that, stores you couldn't go into. And it was an eight, nine-hour drive from D.C. uh, down into South Carolina. And, you know, they they taught us how to act, what to say, and, you know, not to talk back, not to be smart. I mean, there were a lot of stories that Mm -hmm. I think they prepared us for. And once we got in the South, once again, Mm -hmm. uh, the South was still the South. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were things that we could do in the Washington area that we couldn't do when we were down in South Carolina. And so all of the stories leading up to a trip are things that, you know, were emblazoned in your mind. And, uh, and and you respected what your parents said. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, if not, mm-hmm. uh, they were. It was not like parents today. I mean, you got whippings big That's time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you did, and everybody else did. Oh, oh yeah, yes. for sure. <laughs> but uh, there were so many people in my neighborhood um, mm-hmm. that that were there to help, to guide, to lead, and you just all you had to do was be quiet and listen and watch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you can imitate a lot of them. And sports taught me a lot about leadership because it's a team sport. Basketball is a team sport. And it really doesn't matter how blessed you are as an individual athlete. Mm-hmm. In a team sport, you've got to fit in. Mm-hmm. And um, basketball taught me a lot of different things. That God had blessed me with uh, you know, a lot of ability, but I didn't take it for granted. And I knew I was better than some of the guys on my team, but I knew how important they were in order for us to perform and win. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so um, you never looked down on them. Uh, you always really tried to bring them up. You let them know how important they were to you and your success. And that's one of the reasons I go back now, because I'm successful, but it's because there were so many good people around me who gave of themselves to help me move in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And you know that um, having so many that giving back and you know I've heard a couple of things that you, you you're saying um, certainly there's the giving back that you you know you you, you learn so much you were given so much you 
giving back is is really key and important part of leadership. And everything I've heard you talk about uh, is a lot about role models, too. (laughs) You know, people who were there in your life who provided this uh, image or standard of what you should do, how things should be. Uh, Do you find that... Um, you is is that role modeling? You think? Do you think that makes a difference? Oh, I think it makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad was my first role model. Okay, you know my high school coach. He was like a, a surrogate dad. He was mm-hmm. a role model. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were guys off the street um, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. never had a chance uh, to to live their dream. But they were role models. How were they role models? Um, they told you what not to do. Ah, uh, okay. You know, a lot okay. of guys got in trouble. <laughs> right. And uh, okay. they would tell you, you know, you don't want to go down this road. Mm-hmm. You know, this is what I did. Mm-hmm. You don't want to do that. Okay. And uh, those people, um, in a lot of cases, are nameless. Mm-hmm. But uh, they're people mm-hmm. that I remember. Yes. And uh, once again, if they didn't touch me when I was young growing up, I'm sure that I would have made mistakes and um, not sure that I would have been as successful as I have been. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're just joining us, it is my absolute pleasure and delight on Ignite to Impact to be having a great conversation with a true leader, leader in so many areas, business, sports, politics, public service, and we're getting ready to talk about his latest venture, which I think is probably the crowning jewel of all. Um, So, you know, Mayor Bing, I want to um, talk about the work that you're doing now. Uh, You've, uh, as we've, as we've said, you've been very successful in, in, in a sport, basketball, Hall of Famer, uh, one of the top 50 players, basketball players of all time. You've had that success. You, of course, have, you know, successful business. You've grown. um, And then you were the mayor of Detroit uh, at a time that was particularly particularly important for Detroit, for someone like you, who had, uh, you know, people trusted you, people knew you, they trusted you, they always saw you in a good light, a positive light, and you stepped in in that public service role. And now, you're working with young boys. Tell us about it. You know, I, <clears throat> I've been blessed with good health. And when I was about to leave the mayor's office, I knew I wasn't a politician and I had no ambition to run again. Um, There was a tough four and a half years that I was in the office because our city was just in in a trauma. Um, But I learned a lot. And I wanted to continue to give and um, I got a chance to meet uh, President Obama. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he started a couple of different programs and we were really focusing on boys and men of color. And um, it was perfect for me because being mayor, I had a chance to go into parts of the city that I never in all of my years had, had ever visited. Mm-hmm. And I saw the conditions that some of our young people were living in. And um, I was astonished that people still live like that, to be very honest with you. And a lot of it had to do with um, being poor, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, not having good role models. Mm -hmm. Uh, Our whole education system was broken. Um, The family was broken. And I said, I think I can make a difference. Uh, God bless me. I had a good mother and father. And um, some of these kids are coming up in single parent homes. And the mothers are doing all the heavy lifting and there were no men around. And as you look at what's happening in schools around urban America, for whatever reasons, there are not enough men in the area of education. And a lot of it has Mm -hmm. to do with pay, maybe, Mm -hmm. and maybe to to do with their education or lack thereof. But these boys that I started to, um, to get close to, they needed a man in their lives. And I know I was limited because I'm one person. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do was go out and challenge black men and say, I need you to help me. This is what I want to do. I want to start a program to mentor young men, to expose them to what real life is all about and the role that they can play as they grow up, the role that they can play uh, in their communities. 
And uh, so we started uh, almost four years ago. Um, and I didn't want the A and B students because I mm-hmm. think they got a chance to be okay and succeed. I wanted those kids that were C and D on the cusp of maybe not making it. But they needed somebody in their lives. And I believe that one-on-one mentoring is a key. So um, there weren't a lot of black men doing this, a lot of lip service, but I knew a lot of guys and I went out and begged guys to come and join me. And um, we teamed them up with one of the young men. We're now up to 84 young black boys and each one of those black boys Mm. have a black man as his mentor. Mm -hmm. And uh, the challenge is time because a lot of these men have their own families, their own careers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But we're asking them to sign up for at least a minimum of one year. Mm -hmm. One hour every week with the kid at school. And then we take these kids to places that they've never been, trying to expose them to what just life is all about. Mm -hmm. And you build trust and you build confidence in these kids. And all of a sudden, they come out of a shell and they start talking to you, Mm -hmm. opening up about their fears, their challenges, and their dreams. Mm -hmm. And we're part of all of that right now. So um, the business community and the philanthropic community have been unbelievable in helping me from a funding standpoint. But the business community has also stepped up because I go to them and ask, can I speak to your black men? so that I can get them to commit to be a part of this program. So I love what I'm doing. I can see the difference in the lives of some of these kids and things are going very well. It sounds like I hear it <laughs> in your voice. Now, Now the name of your program is Bingo. Is that, is, is, is that that's right? The, or, that's or, the program. That's the program. Yeah. Uh, being Youth um, is, you know, Being Youth Institute. Being <clears throat> Youth Institute. Right. And Bingo is the name of the program okay. where these boys become a part okay, of. Okay, so you have the Being Youth Institute, Correct. which is like the overall umbrella, your agency, and I assume you could do lots of different programs. Yes. And this, this, this one program that we're talking about is called Bingo, Boys Inspired Through Nurturing, Growth, and Opportunities. Did Correct. I get that right? You got right? that right. Okay. I mean, when I came yes. to Detroit yeah. and played downtown with the Pistons, when I'd score a basket, the announcer would say bingo. Oh, and, okay. and that's, All that's right. how that, that's how that came. Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Th- th- but okay, so I got that. So hey, you dribbling down the court, you take that shot, goes <laughs> in, bingo. That's right. It, right. So so that was of course because you're Dave Bing, and the announcer was saying Bing, you go, you Correct. go. Exactly. Right. Exactly. But you've taken that. And you've made it into boys inspired through nurturing, growth, and opportunities. How'd you come up with that? Well, my uh, guy that runs the program for me on a day-to-day basis, I only have one full-time employee. Okay. Uh, we've got six employees. Uh, five of them are retirees mm-hmm. and people whose hearts are in the right place. Mm-hmm, and they're mm-hmm. doing this not to make money. Mm-hmm. They're okay. doing this because um, they see the need and they're, they're filling um, a, a place in our community that they're not enough of us, quite mm-hmm. frankly. But um, Bob Warfield is a guy uh, who runs the program yes. for me on a day-to-day basis and he's an outstanding uh, man. Uh, he mm-hmm. does a lot of good stuff. But mm-hmm. he, he came from um, television. Uh-huh. Uh, that was his career. Okay. And so uh, from a marketing standpoint, from a PR standpoint, he uh, he's really well-versed. Mm-hmm. And he came up with the acronym. Yes, okay. And uh, it, it, it really fits mm-hmm. because we do want, we know how important nurturing is. Mm-hmm. And nurturing leads to growth. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we see the opportunities that are out here for these kids. And uh, we want to let them know what the opportunities are and how they need to prepare themselves because nobody's going to give them anything. Mm -hmm. So whether it's education, uh, whether it's just being a good person, whether it's knowing how to respect your mom, how to respect Mm -hmm. other women, Mm -hmm. all of those things 
are challenges for these young boys because they've not had to do that. Nobody made them do it. And that's one of the reasons that now these men, as they mentors, talk to them every, in some days, uh, in some weeks, every day. Uh-huh. But uh, the relationships are so important uh, to help these boys grow and, and believe in themselves. So so the program, uh, you, so you do the mentoring. This mentoring is one piece of it. And then you do this uh talking and emotional learning and and there's yeah. this exchange with these role models and then you have these outings yeah. that you go to you take them again back to exposing them can you yeah. tell us about some of these outings where do you go what do you do <laughs> well you know <clears throat> we found out in year one when the first 40 boys we had 70 percent had never been to downtown Detroit. They were Detroiters. Now, that's what I was going to say. Now, we are talking about Detroit. Yes, yes. Detroit boys, right? They'd never been to downtown Detroit. What they knew was okay. a six-block area, their neighborhood that they grew up in, okay. and the school that they went to. Uh-huh. But they've not been exposed to anything else. And with all of the changes that are happening in Detroit, uh, they, they need the exposure. So mm-hmm. we would take them to the DIA, Detroit uh, Institute of Arts. Mm-hmm. We take them to the African American Museum. We take them out to Ford. Uh, we take them to different businesses. And for the first time, uh, we took kids out of out of state. Mm. We have um, 22 boys are in their junior year in high school. Okay. And we, we're we letting them know how important college is, mm-hmm. how important education is. Mm-hmm. So we took them on a college tour. Uh, uh-huh. We took these kids and actually flew them down to Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Delta. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, we flew them to Washington. Uh, out of the 18 that went, 17 had never flown before. And so, so we the had... Vet, <laughs> so practically all of them... Yeah. We had to really had teach them... Um, through videos, you know, how to act, how to dress. I mean, just a lot of small things. Okay, so, so wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. May. I want, I want to stop. Let, let's, let's pull back. Um, because that's one of the things that, you know, I really like about what you're doing. You, you are really dealing with the real deal that's happening Absolutely. in our communities, our neighborhoods with young boys. So you actually had to coach them prepare them for not being on the college campus, but taking the trip. Taking the trip, yep. So you showed them videos, you said? We showed them videos because you you don't want to go to the airport in TSA and act crazy and say the wrong thing and can't go, can't get on the plane. Right, I know. (laughs) So you actually had to to let them know what would happen, how someone was going to tell you to take off your shoes and and maybe even pat you down and it might be... (laughs) You got to follow the rules. These are the rules you got to follow. All right. So we took those kids down um, to Howard University. Okay. And then we took them over to Baltimore at Morgan State University. Uh-huh. My alma mater. Okay. And then uh, we, we, we stayed in a, um, the, the very nice hotels okay. because I wanted them to be exposed to things that we as normal people do. Okay. Um, okay. This is not a big deal, you guys. Mm-hmm. This is the way life is supposed to be. Right. You've not been exposed to it, but here it is. And we want you Ex- to have this exactly. life, too. Yes. Okay. And then we took them to the African American Museum, oh, um, which is oh, unbelievable. Goodness. Yes. And we went out to eat every night. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, AKAs were having over in Baltimore. They Ooh, were having, uh, <laughs> they were having their <laughs> annual convention. Uh huh. And so you had all of these older sisters that were yes. down there, and they saw these young brothers walking um, in pairs uh-huh. as we went into the restaurant, uh-huh. and uh, you know, being very respectful. Mm-hmm. And one lady came up and says, "You know, who are these boys?" Mm-hmm. And I explained who we were, right. where we were from. They said, Detroit. <laughs> so, yes, we are from Detroit. Uh-huh. And they were so impressed. The boys mm-hmm. just really did an outstanding job. Mm-hmm. And they're representing this city so very well yes. that I was so proud of them. And I'll tell you, it was a great trip for these kids. But I, I took six mentors with me. Okay. And mm-hmm. uh, because you want to make sure that you've got enough ad- adult supervision so That's that, right. once again, teenagers are all over the place. And uh, we, we had some restrictions. 
And uh, so the men, uh, I was so happy that they chose to go. They took three days out of their life to take this trip Mm -hmm. to oversee uh, these boys and what they were being exposed to. So I think it's a learning experience for the boys, but also for the men. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I I was going to ask you. What did you all learn? I think we've become better men because we forget how tough it is for these kids. Mm -hmm. Because most of these men are in corporate America right now and Mm -hmm. doing well. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to forget what it was like. Most of us uh, came from that kind of situation, but we did what was right, and now we're, you know, moving up in life. And so it's easy to forget that these kids don't need this. And they do, and uh, I, I think it's made a lot of us better fathers, better husbands, mm-hmm. and uh, that's all part mm-hmm. of building the village. Mm-hmm. And you know that, Mr. Mayor, th- th- what you just said, I think, you know, is, is so powerful because, yes, we, we, you're right, we forget what it was like. I think we also forget that were it not for people who were role models, who helped us, Mm -hmm. who exposed us, who tapped us on the shoulder when we were growing up, were it not for them, we may not be where we are today. Absolutely. There's some great shoulders that I had a chance to stay in on. That's right. And I could never uh, forget them or embarrass them. Mm -hmm. You know, it -hmm. it went beyond my home. There were people in in my neighborhood and in my church um, that were there for me the whole time. And so um, I thank them because, uh, as you just said, if it were not for them, uh, you know, as they say, there goes I. That's right. That's right. Well, again, if you're just joining us, we have been having a fantastic, awesome conversation with Mayor Dave Bing, um, who's been a champion leader in many facets of life, but really is devoting himself to his greatest adventure and, and perhaps greatest challenge. So make sure you tune in to our next episode on Ignite to Impact with more from Dave Bing. You've been listening to Ignite to Impact. Your host is Dr. Geneva Williams, who is an award-winning executive facilitator and master leadership strategist. Dr. Geneva is dedicated to inspiring others to get their leadership on and equipping the next generation with leadership tools and tips to help make the world a better place. Sign up to download Dr. Geneva's mini ebook on leadership. Get the show notes, links, and other resources at drgenevaspeaks.com. That's drgenevaspeaks.com. Thanks for listening. Please share the podcast to those in your community via Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Google Plus, and leave us a five star review in iTunes. When you do that, it helps others find the podcast easier. Send your questions or comments to info at drgenevaspeaks.com.